All right, we will go ahead and get started. So welcome everybody to this evening's Brand CEU Talk. Uh, my name is Erin McKinley. I'm the current president of Brand. And before we get started with the talk this evening, I just want to make a few announcements that were brand related. And so we are still accepting nominations for executive board positions, including president elect, secretary and nominations chair. And I will put into the chat the link if you are interested in getting nominated or nominating someone you know who may be interested in filling one of those positions. And also, since I am the director of dietetics at LSU, I wanted to post our job posting. We have an open position for a full-time uh, nutrition instructor um, at the, at least the master's level. So I know many of you um, do have your master's degrees or know folks who do who may be interested in maybe coming back to LSU to teach uh, the future generations of registered dietitians. And so also I will put in the chat the sign in link for this evening. And so this is uh, approved for 1.0 CEU. And so in order to get that, we will need you to sign in on the link in the chat and provide your CDR number. So we have that on file and I will email you the CEU form tomorrow. And so to get us started with this talk this evening, I went to those who are always brand loyal to our group and Autumn is definitely one of those members. And I reached out to her since March is not just National Nutrition Month, but also National Kidney Month. And she was so gracious to team up with Catherine Rowan, her coworker, to put together this talk, Nutrition Management for Adults on Chronic Dialysis. And if you don't, it seems like everybody knows each other in here, but for those on the recording who may be watching this later, um, our speakers are Autumn Schilling and Catherine Rowan. They're both LSU alumni, and they both work for Fresenius Medical Care and renal care. And so here in Baton Rouge, and so they've put this talk together and got it approved by Fresenius and I'm gonna let them take it away. Thank you. Um, everyone can see my screen okay. Okay, thanks everybody for joining our presentation about nutrition management for adults on chronic dialysis. Um, we're excited for this opportunity because the renal diet gets a bad rep for being a very strict, complicated diet. And the truth is that it is. So we as dietitians do our best to help our patients meet their goals while also being able to enjoy their lives. As with any aspect of nutrition, we're still finding things out and having to adapt as new research surfaces. So we hope this presentation will help strengthen your understanding of nutrition concerns with the dialysis population. So for conflicts of interest, we don't have anything to disclose. Our objectives for this is we hope you understand the major nutrients of concern for people on chronic dialysis, no practical tips for patients to help them follow a renal diet, know how to calculate protein and calorie needs based on the appropriate body weight, understand the link between sodium and fluid intake, understand the concept and implications of phosphorus bioavailability, know how to identify food additives and processed foods that affect the major nutrients of concern and understand the importance of renal vitamins. So I briefly wanted to touch on the types of dialysis. We have hemodialysis or HD, which filters your blood using a dialysis machine to send blood through a dialyzer. Three common types of hemodialysis are in-center, which is three sessions per week for about four hours, in center, which is overnight three sessions per week for about six to eight hours, and home, which is at home, typically four sessions per week for about three to four hours. Then we have peritoneal dialysis, or PD, which uses the blood vessels in the lining of your abdomen, the body's natural filter, along with a solution called dialysate to filter toxins. This dialysis is done daily at home. You have CAPD, which is manual exchanges throughout the day, and CCPD, which is exchanges performed by a cycler at night. Many nutrition considerations are similar in both of these modalities, but there are some differences which will be discussed throughout the presentation. So listed on the slide are major nutrients of concern, listed in the order in which we'll discuss them, energy, protein, sodium and fluid, phosphorus, 
potassium, calcium, and other micronutrients and real vitamins. So we'll first start our talk with energy needs. So calorie needs for the maintenance of patients on dialysis is similar to, or possibly slightly greater than that of non-dialysis patients. Shown on the right-hand side, side of the slide are the recommendations. For HD, it's recommended that patients have a daily intake of 25 to 35 calories per kilogram of body weight. You'll notice that their calorie recommendations for PD are the same. However, their food intake should be adjusted to account for the calories absorbed from dialysis. Below the chart is an example of the calorie recommendations. For a 75 kilogram, 50 year old male that is sedentary, has no present illness, and a desire to maintain weight, we would recommend a caloric intake of 2,250 calories per day on a 30 calorie per kilogram recommendation. Since he is a male with more muscle mass and no desire to lose weight, we would not select the lower bound of the recommendations. But since he is sedentary and not has no inflammation or other illness that would increase his needs, we didn't select a higher range. Consuming adequate, adequate calories is also important for maintaining albumin levels, which brings us to our next topic, protein. So recommended protein intakes for this population are higher than the general population. For all modalities, the recommendation is one to 1.2 grams per kilogram of body weight to maintain a stable nutritional status for metabolically stable patients. In all modalities, there are losses of protein with each dialysis session, ranging from 10 to 15 grams of protein in HD and five to 15 grams for 24 hours with PD. You can see our example for the patient on the previous slide. And for him, we did 1.2 grams. Protein needs might need to be increased if a patient is acutely ill or known to have protein energy wasting or may need to be considered to maintain glycemic control for diabetic patients. As you can imagine, all needs should be considered on an individual basis and not copy pasted for each patient. Note that we have not indicated that 50% of protein should be of high biological value or animal-based protein. Plant-based proteins are becoming more acceptable in kidney diets, and these diets are associated with better outcomes. However, you will find that not all education materials and practitioners have caught up with the current research. So let's talk through some challenges related to protein intake because getting one to 1.2 grams per day is much easier said than done. First, we'll discuss additives. Although we haven't discussed these other nutrients, you'll likely have a basic understanding that renal diets may need to be limited in sodium, potassium, and phosphorus. And unfortunately for our patients, these minerals are often used to enhance meat products, frequently in ways that are hard to identify. So let's take sodium, for example. Shown on this slide, we have three different chicken breast products all from the same manufacturer. For a similar portion size of 112 grams, you can see that we have vastly different sodium contents. For the fresh chicken on the left, we see it contains 75 milligrams of sodium per serving. For the frozen chicken, that amount has almost quadrupled to 290 milligrams. And then in the pre-cooked chicken, there is a whopping 600 milligrams of sodium, which is eight times the amount of sodium in the fresh chicken. Now, lucky for us, sodium is listed on the food label. So for each of these foods, we can make an informed choice. Unfortunately, that is not the case for phosphorus and potassium. The best choice for our patients is fresh meat as opposed to frozen or pre-cooked that is minimally processed, whole chicken versus parts of a chicken, and to read nutrition labels. If there is an ingredient list, check to see if there are additives listed. If there is no ingredient list, check the rest of the label to see if there are any added solutions. Labels with no ingredient list and no statements of added solutions are the least likely to contain additives, although they might still be present in small amounts. The next protein intake challenge we face is related to plant-based proteins and the stigma surrounding them. Historically, plant-based foods, high in protein, such as nuts and legumes, have been shunned because of their perceived elevated levels of potassium and phosphorus. And as you can see, the protein content of the plant-based foods is comparable, if not better, than the animal protein. Potassium and phosphorus still present a challenge but the bioavailability of phosphorus and the plant-based foods is relatively low, making it a viable choice. Potassium content of these foods is clearly high, but we will discuss how to incorporate this into the diet later. Now 
We'll just briefly touch on protein supplements as an option for patients needing to get more protein. Protein supplements are a convenient, albeit potentially expensive option for some patients to get the protein they need. They come in many forms, including shakes, powders, and bars. There are products available for dialysis patients with higher protein content and lower electrolyte content for volume. Pictured on the slide are the two protein supplements that we carry on formulary, Nepro and Liquicil, but we try to be aware of other supplements for patients to use at home as many patients can experience taste fatigue and may enjoy using a different product. Next, we're gonna discuss sodium and fluids. Unlike protein and calories, where we are trying to get in a minimum quantity, we are now switching gears and covering nutrients that we want to limit. For sodium, we have paired it along with a fluid restriction because they go hand in hand. And if you read the first bullet there, it sums things up quite nicely. Advising dialysis patients to restrict fluid without restricting sodium intake is not based on evidence and is a waste of time. It's a waste of time because we know that sodium intake is one of the primary drivers of thirst. Think back to the last time you ate something really salty, like a slice of pizza or a giant salty pretzel. You probably had a drink with it, or if you didn't, you probably grabbed something soon after. And whether something tastes salty or not, your body knows when it takes in sodium and triggers the thirst mechanism. This is of particular concern because most patients with ESRD are aneuric and lack the ability to excrete excess sodium and fluid in their urine. This excess sodium and fluid builds up and can contribute to elevated blood pressure, left ventricular hypertrophy, volume overload, intradialytic hypotension, increased proteinuria, and even death. You'll see over on the right-hand side, that for HD patients, the recommendation is less than 2,300 milligrams of sodium per day. Given that the average daily sodium intake for Americans two years or older is more than 3,400 milligrams, you can see how this is quite a challenge. The more you can lower sodium in a patient's diet, the better. Now, if you look at the fluid intake, you'll see that we have 1,000 milliliters plus fluid output. Some patients do still have the valuable kidney function and produce urine. If the patient produces 500 milliliters of urine per day, then they could have 1,500 milliliters of fluid. Looking over at the PD recommendations, you can see that the recommendation for sodium intake is also 2,300 milligrams. Since PD patients dialyze more frequently, they may have better volume status than HD patients. It is harder to set a limit on how much fluid they should consume, so it really comes down to monitoring their signs and symptoms of edema. Regardless, PD is not a license to drink whatever you want, and these patients should still be counseled on limiting sodium and fluid. Now, what are some of the challenges with limiting sodium intake? First and foremost, our issue is processed foods. According to the CDC, more than 40% of the sodium we eat each day comes from only 10 types of food listed here. Pictured on the right is a nice example of how a single sandwich can add up to 1,500 milligrams of sodium pretty quickly. So let's discuss some strategies for reducing sodium intake. Firstly, we need to limit processed foods and focus on consuming more fresh foods. Cooking at home is a great way to avoid processed foods. It allows more control over the ingredients, especially how much salt is added, and can encourage patients to try more herbs and salt-free spices. If patients do choose to eat processed foods, encourage them to read the food label. Choose low sodium or no salt added versions of foods. Choose unenhanced meats. When looking at the nutrition facts, choose foods that have less than 10% daily value of sodium and have more calories than sodium. Some very low calorie foods or foods with small serving sizes like condiments and salad dressing can meet the less than 10% rule, but will have far more sodium than calories in them. Too many foods like this can add up really fast. Finally, make sure patients watch their portion sizes of packaged foods. If the label says that a food has 10% of the daily value of sodium and you eat three servings, then you've really had 30% of your sodium for the day. Although sodium intake is the number one fluid challenge, there are other things to consider. One issue is hidden sources, and we are using the term hidden pretty loosely because many patients think that only water counts towards their fluid restriction and forget about these other drinks that they regularly consume. On the right-hand side are things more akin to hidden sources. Explain to patients that anything that melts is considered a fluid, so ice, ice cream, 
popsicles, sherbet, and gelatin desserts would all fall into that category. There are also some foods that are very high fluid volume. The two that come to mind are soup and watermelon. Another potential fluid intake challenge that goes along with hidden fluid sources is the fluid used to take medications. Not every patient remembers to count this fluid in their totals for the day, and it can quickly add up. One study determined that the median number of types of medications taken by patients was 11, for a median total of 19 pills a day. If a patient takes an average sip of fluid, which is about 16 mils or just over a tablespoon with each pill, then they will end up consuming 304 milliliters of fluid just for the medications. This means that patients may have to set aside as much as 30% of their daily fluid allowance just to take the medications. So some things to try to help manage fluid in this context are to be sure that patients know that this counts as part of their fluid total. Another option is if the medication can be taken with food, encourage patients to take food with foods such as applesauce or yogurt to place the pill in and swallow. And finally, discuss with the prescriber if the pill burn can be reduced. This would not only reduce the amount of fluid that needs to be consumed, but research shows that patients are more likely to take medications as prescribed when there's fewer pills. Dry mouth is a common issue that causes dialysis patients to drink excess fluid and many factors contribute to a patient having dry mouth. ESRD affects the ability to produce saliva, so our patients naturally have less saliva production. Uncontrolled diabetes also affects saliva production, and there's over 500 medications that have side effects with dry mouth. And of course, fluid restriction, especially if patients are consuming too much sodium, can contribute. So these are just a few ways to help our patients with dry mouth, sugar-free gum, uh, talking to the, medic the doctor to see if there's another medication that doesn't have dry mouth as a side effect. Of course, following a low sodium diet and listening to our dietitian. Rinse mouth daily with non-alcoholic mouthwash, artificial saliva, and other products might help as well. So here are some strategies for limiting fluid intake. <laughs> Obviously, our biggest one is reducing sodium intake in our patient's diet. Next, you'll want to address pill burden if possible and help them strategize how to best take their medications. Identify patients with dry mouth and poorly controlled diabetes and see if you can help with that. Make sure patients understand how much they are drinking. Um, some patients like to drink water from a frozen water bottle and sip on it slowly throughout the day. It's especially helpful in the summer months. And similarly, some patients like to freeze fruit such as grapes to give them a burst of cool moisture. And finally, working with nurses on fluid and volume management. Phosphorus is the next mineral we will discuss. In my opinion, it's one of my favorite minerals. <laughs> like sodium, intake of this mineral can be very challenging to control. Due to the different factors that impact phosphorus levels, such as dialysis removal based on modality, pharmacological therapy, and variation absorption based on the type of phosphorus in foods, Daily dietary phosphorus recommendations vary per individual. Only a small amount of phosphorus is removed during each session. So dialysis treatment alone isn't considered an effective method of removing phosphorus. The guidelines recommend adjusting intake to maintain serum levels within normal limits and to also consider the bioavailability, which we'll discuss in a minute. We know that patients that can meet their protein needs while controlling phosphorus levels have better outcomes. So we don't wanna restrict phosphorus to a level that makes it impossible to meet protein needs. <clears throat> phosphorus management is important for this population because phosphorus is one of the primary components of bone along with calcium. And when phosphorus levels become elevated along with other hormonal imbalances, we can start to see increased bone deposits in the vasculature and soft tissues of patients. This increases both morbidity and mortality. One of the first challenges is understanding that the bioavailability of phosphorus, or the amount that actually enters the bloodstream, varies considerably among organic and inorganic foods. First, let's discuss organic phosphorus. Plant-based organic phosphorus, also referred to as phytates, occur in plant-based foods such as vegetables, legumes, nuts, seeds, and grains. This type of phosphorus is very difficult to absorb 
as we lack the enzyme needed to digest it. So studies estimate that only 10 to 50% is absorbed. The other type of naturally occurring phosphorus is protein bound and found mostly in animal products. It has a higher bioavailability, 40 to 60%, because unlike the phytate bound, we have the necessary enzymes to digest protein. As previously discussed, a lot of meats have hidden additives to enhance or help preserve them, which brings us to our next slide. <clears throat> Unlike the organic forms of phosphorus that are bound to protein and phytates, phosphorus additives are salts that readily disassociate and therefore are more readily absorbed. Up to 100% of consumed additives can be absorbed. Products containing phosphate salts are also significantly higher in sodium, up to six times higher, so let's take a look at examples of phosphate additives. <clears throat> so phosphate additives serve a variety of different purposes in the food industry, as you can see in the chart. It is estimated that 50% of processed foods found in a typical grocery store contain some form of added phosphate. So how would you or a patient go about finding out how much phosphorus is in a product? Where is it located on the food label? It's not. It's not on the food label. Federal guidelines don't currently require phosphorus content to be disclosed on a food label. <clears throat> Until it is required, and there's no guarantee it ever will be, we must do a little detective work. And this makes for a pretty significant challenge in limiting phosphorus intake. So for now, the best way to identify phosphorus additives in foods is to read the ingredient list next to the food label. Although there are numerous forms of phosphorus additives, they tend to follow a common name convention containing phos somewhere in the name. So you can see in red, we have the phos highlighted. Although this method of identifying phosphorus additives doesn't give us a good idea of the actual amount, it just alerts us to its presence. And then if it's a Spanish label, it would say FOS. So here's an example of phosphate additives listed in the ingredient list. And you can imagine it's pretty difficult to spot if you're in the grocery store, if there isn't a red box around it for you. So <laughs> there's three different ones here, but they're kind of buried in there. So we've discussed some complicated challenges for managing phosphorus intake. As professionals, we need to have a strong understanding of bioavailability to help make better recommendations to patients that won't scare them away from eating high protein foods simply because they tend to be high in phosphorus. It's also important to not get hung up on the numbers. Phosphorus is not reported on the label and it's not readily available online. So giving them numbers to focus on is pointless. I had a patient tell me that Alexa would tell them how much phosphorus was in food, but Alexa doesn't know either, you guys. <laughs> For patients, it's best to focus on specific food selection habits and behaviors. Above all else, they should be taught how to avoid phosphorus additives. This means that they should focus on choosing fresh foods. If a food doesn't come with a label, then it probably doesn't have phosphorus additives. Limit processed foods, and if they do eat processed foods, be sure to read the ingredients label to check out the phos additives. Limit dining out, especially fast food, and be sure to choose unenhanced meats. Another factor in limiting phosphorus intake that isn't listed on the slide is making sure patients are taking their phosphate binders. Phosphate binders are medications that can bind phosphorus in the GI tract and prevent absorption when taken with food. These are used in addition to the behaviors and habits listed on the slide and not instead of. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Catherine to talk about potassium. Hi, I'm Catherine and I'll be going through the rest of the presentation. So like Autumn said, the next mineral we'll discuss is potassium. Both hyperkalemia and hypokalemia can lead to arrhythmias and sudden cardiac arrest. Too much or too little of other nutrients can cause harm to our patients, especially if their labs are chronically out of range. Fluctuations in these other nutrients generally result in more long-term issues rather than acute risk of death. As such, you'll learn that when reviewing labs of patients, you'll tend to prioritize seeing patients with abnormal potassium levels first. Although the exact amount of potassium that your patients can tolerate while maintaining normal levels will vary by patient, 
you'll find that your PD patients tend to require more potassium than HD patients. This is due to the fact that potassium is well dialyzed and PD patients are dialyzing more often than HD patients. If a PD patient is presenting with elevated potassium levels, you should question whether they're following their dialysis prescription. Fruits and vegetables are both beneficial and challenging in the diets of dialysis patients. Fiber is an important benefit of these and a good method of controlling potassium levels since it helps to prevent constipation. Potassium is excreted in stool, therefore regular bowel movements may aid in the prevention of hyperkalemia. It's still important to keep in mind the potassium content of high fiber foods, which means including fruits and vegetables in the diet while healthy can be tricky. Decreasing potassium intake from lower fiber foods in favor of high fiber foods that are lower in potassium, such as berries, grapes, and green beans may help with this balance. Another challenge with fruits and vegetables is how much a patient would typically consume. A good example of this is watermelon. This technically is considered to be a low potassium fruit because a full cup serving of cubed watermelon only contains 170 milligrams. The problem is that usually watermelon is not served cubed and portioned into one cup servings. It's frequently cut into thick slices and served. When this happens, the potassium content doubles to 320 milligrams. So you can see how quickly this adds up. Now, what if a patient sits down and eats a whole watermelon? This contains more than 5,000 milligrams of potassium. A similar example would be tomatoes. A few tomatoes or a slice on a sandwich probably won't hurt, but patients shouldn't ladle a cup of tomato sauce onto their pasta unless they have hypokalemia and struggle to keep their potassium levels up. There are many potassium intake challenges in the various food groups. We'll review some of these relating to whole grains, legumes, and dairy. As you're about to see, the lowest potassium food is not necessarily the best choice. Good clinical judgment involving consideration of other nutrients and potassium content as a percent of total requirements allow for good recommendations. In our whole grains example, we'll compare brown rice and white rice. These are pretty much identical in terms of their protein and phosphorus content, but we see the biggest difference in their potassium and fiber content. Brown rice contains three times as much potassium, but seven times as much fiber. From a nutritional perspective, the advantage of increased fiber is worth the extra potassium. The higher potassium content is between 3.3% and 5% of the potassium restriction for dialysis patients, making the extra potassium negligible. Next, we have legumes. These are an excellent source of protein and fiber, but are also quite high in potassium. This does vary somewhat. As you can see, Garbanzo beans are on the lower end with 238 milligrams of potassium per half cup serving, while soybeans are on the higher end with 485 milligrams per half cup serving. These numbers don't mean that patients have to avoid legumes. They're overall nutritious foods and have been shown to reduce mortality in dialysis patients. The key is choosing legumes on the lower end of the potassium spectrum and limiting portion size. Last, we'll look at dairy. The potassium numbers actually appear to be quite low, but it's important to note the small portion size. The potassium issue, the next potassium issue we'll review is the use of salt substitutes. Since many patients are encouraged to limit sodium intake, they may gravitate toward these thinking they're acceptable. So it's important to make sure patients are aware that all salt substitutes contain potassium chloride as the substitute. For most in-center HD patients, we recommend avoiding these entirely, while for PD patients, you may actually have to encourage their use. In addition, when talking to patients about salt substitutes, make sure that it's clear what you're referring to. Some people also commonly refer to salt-free seasonings, such as Mrs. Dash, as a salt substitute. These seasonings are just made of herbs and spices and no potassium chloride. Another challenge we face is additives and labeling. This includes fish and other meats containing potassium additives. We'll 
We'll end our discussion of potassium with some strategies for controlling potassium intake. For patients that need to lower their potassium, avoid constipation and consume adequate fiber. Avoid enhanced meats. Avoid salt substitutes. Encourage patients to experiment with other herbs and spices. Focus on lower potassium fruits and vegetables. Don't avoid whole grains. Control portion sizes. If a patient presents with high potassium levels, do a deep dive into their food intake to determine root cause. Don't stop if the patient happens to mention eating one high potassium fruit or vegetable. Don't assume that it's the root cause. If needed, some doctors may prescribe potassium binders. For patients with higher potassium needs, we recommend liberalizing their diet, encouraging larger portions of fruits and vegetables, and allowing the use of salt substitutes to season foods. And it's important to note that these patients should still avoid constipation and avoid enhanced meats due to the sodium and phosphorus content. The next nutritional consideration we'll discuss is calcium. The 2020 calcium recommendation for both modalities is to adjust intake, factoring in diet, supplements, binders, and dialysate. Consider the use of vitamin D and other bone medications and to avoid hypercalcemia. Note that asymptomatic hypocalcemia may be tolerated under certain circumstances as indicated in the KDGO bone and mineral guidelines. Like phosphorus, excess calcium can lead to increased deposits of bone and vasculature and soft tissues, as well as cause cardiac arrhythmias. Symptomatic low calcium can also lead to adynamic bone disease and cardiac arrhythmias. So, Dairy products, while typically rich in calcium, in moderation, they don't contribute to elevated calcium levels. Generally, dairy is limited due to its high content of phosphorus and sodium. You'll see that our recommendations are one serving per day, which is one ounce of cheese or half cup servings of other dairy products, especially milk. Fortified foods and additives. Many processed foods are fortified with calcium or added as an additive, which may add up in the diet. It's recommended to complete a food recall when calcium is elevated. Always ask for specific brands and encourage patients to bring in food labels of any foods they're unsure of. Um, almost every food will have a lower calcium substitute. Supplements and medications. Common culprits are over-the-counter vitamins, vitamin D supplements containing calcium, and calcium containing antacids. A few recommendations to avoid extra calcium include recommend patients take specially formulated renal vitamins without calcium. If vitamin D supplements are prescribed, discuss choosing one without added calcium and choose non-calcium containing medications to alleviate reflux symptoms. Some strategies to help patients control their calcium intake, like we discussed, includes ensuring that patients understand what counts as a serving of dairy one ounce for cheese, and only half a cup for all other dairy products. Based on calcium lab values, provide patients with a target number of servings that they can have per day. One serving per day is a common recommendation. It's important to encourage patients to limit processed foods and to focus on fresh foods. Teach patients how to look for calcium information on the food label so they're aware of how much the foods contain. Consider giving them a target percent daily value to focus on, such as 10%. Ask patients about their supplement and vitamin use to ensure that they're not taking anything with added calcium. If a patient is currently prescribed a calcium-based phosphate binder, consult with the physician to see if it can be changed. Now we'll look at a few other micronutrients to consider. So this is our list of other micronutrient needs for ESRD patients. A detailed discussion of all vitamins is beyond the scope of this presentation, but we wanted to mention that these nutrients either dialyze out or have specific recommendations for dialysis patients. Although we want patients to focus on the major nutrients we've discussed when planning their meals, these also need to be considered. So we see here that we have listed folic acid, vitamin C, vitamin D, vitamin A and E, vitamin K, and selenium and zinc.
To get adequate amounts of the vitamins listed on the previous slide, we recommend a renal vitamin. Some key points to remember with renal vitamins are they should be taken after dialysis. We don't want a patient to take their vitamin before coming to dialysis because the vitamin would be dialyzed out. We need to ensure that patients are taking a renal vitamin and not a regular multivitamin. Vitamins that aren't specially formulated for the renal population may contain too much calcium, phosphorus, potassium, and iron. Last, we'll take a look at some meal plans to see how to put all of this information together. So this is an example of a meal plan that's higher in fruits, vegetables, legumes, whole grains, and fiber, while being lower in sodium and refined sugar. The pictured foods are actually recipes housed on FreseniusKidneyCare.com. Looking at this menu, we can see that this is a healthy diet, and if patient lab values are within normal ranges, we would ideally prefer them to be consuming a balanced diet such as this. For patients with elevated potassium levels, we can decrease dietary potassium without decreasing too much fiber, as we'll see on the next slide. Here's the same meal plan, but with a few tweaks. In this version, we've adjusted breakfast so that there is an extra egg and so that the eggs are cooked in butter. Instead of two pieces of whole grain toast with almond butter, they're now having one piece with regular butter. For lunch, we decided to only include half a pear. We swapped out the afternoon snack to be a small box of dried cranberries instead of a small box of raisins. For dinner, we omitted the corn. We made no changes to the evening snack. As you can see, potassium was reduced to two grams while still getting adequate calories, protein, and fiber. Both meal plans depicted are excellent ways of putting the entire picture of renal nutrition into perspective. This concludes our slideshow on nutritional recommendations for dialysis patients. We hope you found the presentation informative and now have a good understanding of dietary restrictions and allowances for patients with end-stage renal disease on dialysis. Any questions? reading through the chat to see if there's anything, but feel free to come off mute and ask questions. Well, I really talkative to much today. <laughs> okay, well, all right, Erin, I guess that's it. All right, thank you all so much for putting that together. I was having flashbacks of my internship, but I, I it got the- Hopefully they're good yeah. flashbacks. It got the good, no, the good, now my brain, the wheels are turning. So if someone were to ask me a question, I could probably answer it correctly now. So thank you so much for putting this together. And so if you do want your CEU form, please go to that link that's in the chat. And just to let you know that our next meeting is going to be on Monday, April 25th at 5.30 here on Zoom. Uh, it's 1.0 C, uh, CEU pending. It's going to be with Dr. Bailey Houteling talking about assessing and understanding food environments in Louisiana to better help your clientele. And so that's it for this evening. Thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you next month. Bye everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thanks.